coming up, the Heat 2X engine from Copenhagen. Falcon 9 has some great re-entry footage. And we're joined live by Tyler Reno, the CEO and founder of Open Space Orbital, to talk about his Kickstarter campaign for a rocket. Stay tuned! Tomorrow begins now. And welcome to tomorrow, episode 7.25 for Saturday, August 16th, 2014. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me, as always, the beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented Carrie and Higginbotham, and will be your hosts for this epic So, Do you like the way I did that? I do. Yeah, that was, that was pretty fun. Uh, before we get started with space news this week, I did want to give a huge thank you to the premier patrons of tomorrow. These are the people who've contributed at least $10 to this specific episode. There are so many people this week, we had to break it into three columns. You guys are freaking awesome. You are the lifeblood of this show. If you'd like more information on how you can support tomorrow, you can head over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. Uh, we are a crowdfunded show, so every dollar helps. You don't have to do just ten dollars, or just you don't have to do just ten dollars. That's true too. You can do hundred dollars. <laughs> you can do hundred dollars, perhaps. Accept so whatever that you as want, well. Whatever you want. That's you don't have so to do funny. ten dollars. You can do like mm -hmm. one dollar if you want, or what, whatever you think is fair for this episode. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, Copenhagen suborbitals. You I said love. That wrong. Copenhagen suborbitals. I love these guys. They are crazy, uh, but in like a good in the mad. Best way. They're like crazy mad scientists, kind of like in the good way. Yes. Uh, these are the guys who they're like. Mm, let's build a submarine, and so they <laughs> so they build a submarine. They're like, mm, let's build a rocket. So they're building a rocket, and they they plan on sending a human on this rocket eventually. So here is a static fire test. This happened earlier today, August 16th at 1330 Universal Time. This was broadcast, by the way, this was broadcast live. Kudos to Copenhagen yes. for broadcasting this live. A lot of companies and entities, and they, they don't broadcast these things because yes. they're so afraid of failure. These guys did it live. Check it out. 10, nine, eight, shoot. Six, five, four, three. All right, now, at this point, I think we kind of lose audio. Now, it, we're about to lose everything. There you go. There, we just and, burned through all the cameras. And yep. Boom. There boom. you are. Later today or tomorrow, we will post some photos where you can actually see all the cameras on the test stand burning. <laughs> uh, I have uh, brought with me a couple of examples here, as you can see. Uh, I'll sh try to show it to the camera. This here actually once was uh, one of our high-speed uh, GoPro cameras. Um, maybe we can salvage something from it, but uh, it looks quite burnt. But it looks pretty intact. It's quite incredible, though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this, however, is <laughs> the uh, backside of uh, of one of our high-speed cameras, and this is not doing so uh, so well. And we have a lot of uh, stuff, but but we this will. Thing? Oh yeah, this is one of the remote controls from the uh, from the cameras that we also managed to salvage up from the platform. But uh, but apart from all this, apart from the engine failure, I actually think that we had a pretty good test. We have learned a lot today. So here's a shot where it actually you can see the whole thing from top to bottom. There it goes. I feel like there's fire shooting out of the side of that thing. <laughs> and, and I think that was engine cutoff, and I think it's still on fire. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, so that's what these static fires are for, is to learn, is to learn about these engines. Um, uh, the engine had a burn through, and it did shut down prematurely. But look at how awesome this is coming along. Also, I love the windmill and the or the yeah the windmill in the yeah, background yeah. The, the, for power generator. That, that's just that's just awesome. So yeah, that's 
That was their test that happened earlier today. So it was cool. they were fairly on time. They got their procedures down. They learned a lot from this. Uh, you know, they they obviously have some stuff to work on on their engine, but I'm excited for them to do another live stream of this totally. and to to show what's going on and all their burnt cameras and everything else was pretty cool. I love too. that and oh, keep the burnt cameras. Keep the burnt cameras. Those are mementos. They they are. Put them in, <laughs> put them in a bucket and just like every launch just have a new bucket just of burnt cameras. <laughs> uh, all right. So, uh awesome. let's Let's move along. So SpaceX released the recovery footage or oh, yeah. uh, the stage one re-entry footage, not recovery footage, stage one re-entry footage for OrgCom. Check this out. So here we go. We've got Falcon 9 sitting on the pad. This is a couple flights ago. You can see the OrbCom fairing sitting up top. I love that shot. This is the recovery airplane going out. Or not, I keep saying recovery. This is, yeah. the, this is a plane with a camera on it mm -hmm. trying to track it. Now, you, if you look in the middle of the screen, kind of hard to see, well, you're actually going to see stage one free falling back to Earth. How amazing is that? You'll see another shot of it coming up it here in a second. It looks fake. I, I'm not going to lie. The first couple of times I saw this. There you go. Just whoosh. It just looks fake. This, this thing. Now, here you go. You've got Unreal. the final landing burn on. You can see it kind of pushing and parting the water. And unfortunately, the plane oh. is scary far away and could not maintain track. And it did lose it at the end, but yeah. uh, and I know we all wanted to see like that last, you know, it was just like like two more sure, seconds. Sure, sure, fire, but <laughs> two, ah! two more seconds, two more seconds. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter. The fact that they got anything at all was pretty it's remarkable, pretty cool. and um, I think it's it's just awesome and inspiring footage seeing a rocket stage free fall, free fall back, <laughs> light, right, it's free fall back, also light crazy. its engines, and basically hover over the ocean before cutting its engine. Uh, I don't know how long until SpaceX is ready to land on land, but hopefully it'll be coming up shortly here because those camera views will be amazing. Oh, yeah. One way or another, they will be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we had some launch coverage. This comes from Space Launch Complex 3 East at Vandenberg Air Force Base. Yay. It's an Atlas V in a 401 configuration. Five, four, three, two. We have ignition and... We have liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket carrying the Worldview 3 satellite for Digital Globe. And there you go. This happened on August 13th, 2014 and 1830 Universal Time. This is the most powerful Earth imaging satellite for the commercial market that hath ever been built. I said hath. Mm -hmm. It is capable of resolving surface features on the Earth as small as one foot across and it's a multi-spectral imaging system and a high-speed data downlink. Check this out. 1.2 gigabits per second is how fast this thing can down. That is faster than my home internet <laughs> by not a small margin. Hmm. So um, uh, this is a quote from Neil Anderson, who is the vice president of technology at Digital Globe. He said, quote, with the capabilities of this satellite, we could see home plate in Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles. Not only can we see home plate, we can see the players in the field. And if we knew which teams were playing and what color uniforms they were using, we could tell you which team is in the field, which team is batting. We could even count empty seats. And if the stadium scoreboard was big enough, we could tell you the score. Yeah. So, creepy. Oh, I'm going to, a little creepy. A little creepy, but I think it's hilarious. You can tell that Neil is not a baseball fan. <laughs> because, because, well... It seems to me that if you can go all the way down to one foot, mm -hmm. the average human is a little bit bigger than one foot. Sure. Could you not read that on the back of their, or on the front of their jersey, well, no. it says Dodgers or you, Tigers, for instance? You may not be able to. It depends on the angle in which, so you might be looking straight down at the field. Okay. You might be looking at it at I'm a slight saying, angle. I'm just saying, they said that they can count empty seats, and yet they're telling me they can't tell me whether or not it's the Dodgers at bat? <laughs> Nick Forever says, I hope Facebook doesn't get their hands on this. <laughs> <laughs> just, oh, Facebook are, you know what? Never Facebook's mind. already scarier gonna, than this. It doesn't yeah. matter. All right. <laughs> Moving I just on. think it's hilarious. Moving right along, this is an interesting piece of news. United Launch Alliance has had a switch up in their CEO, the old president, Michael Gass, who has led United Launch Alliance since its inception in 2006, has been replaced by Tony Bruno, who's an executive at Lockheed Martin. Now, the interesting thing here is that 
Uh, Michael Gass was also a Lockheed employee, and United Launch Alliance is a consortium between Lockheed and Boeing. So there is no, sometimes you have companies like this where you're, you've got multiple companies joining together where you go, you know, company A runs it for a while, then company B, then company A, then company B. Sure. Clearly that is not the case here you because we just, went, we just went Lockheed, Lockheed, right, back to back. So that was interesting. It also felt very sudden to me. So maybe not. Um, it, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens on August 20th with those engines coming in for the Atlas V. Yep. So we talked about this last week saying, you know, all signs are pointing to yes, United Launch Alliance is going to get that shipment of engines from Russia, the RD-180 engine for the Atlas V rocket. Despite uh, sanctions. Despite sanctions, despite anything else. Um, but then this came along and it felt very sudden. So I... I don't, I mean, I'm purely speculating here, but that felt weird. Sure, it feels sudden, but I, I don't know. I mean, it does, he's, he didn't step down already, right? He's he said he's retiring at the, at the end, end of the, of the year. year. Right? So, I mean, there's been a little bit of notice. He didn't need to three months ago say, hey guys, by the way, uh, I might be uh, heading out this year. I, you know, it, it also could be that he's we're decided not inside to, the company. He decided to maybe step there's down. rumblings. We don't necessarily know that. We have. You're right. We have absolutely no idea. But it I think does feel sudden. It su feels sudden, <laughs> and I think we'll have a lot more data in like a month. Sure. So we'll, we'll hold. We'll hold for a month and see what happens there. Um, the opposite of Copenhagen suborbitals would be China. So China launched a Long March 4C rocket on Sunday, August 10th at 5.45 Universal Time. And that was And live let's, live. uh, there's no video. So. <laughs> no, no, that was, that was live. We just missed it. We just, there was no video. There was, like, lots of... Uh, this was a military launch. Well, this may have been a military. So... Video? You have video? All right, go, go I've, got, I've got video. Ready? Here, here right, go. ready. Director there. says... All right, that there was awesome. Go. Awesome. Awesome video. Perfect. Uh, China says that these are scientific satellites, although Western countries, such as the United States, believe that these are part of a naval monitoring fleet. China also said that, oh, no, 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 this is just one satellite. However, our long-range tracking system found three, not one, and not where they said they were going to be. So Maybe it broke up. It broke up into three pieces? No. In fact, we no. monitored the three, the three different uh, satellites in their stable orbits, mind you. Broke up into three pieces in stable maybe, orbit. Maybe. And we also monitored the upper stage. No, I, maybe it's 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 a yeah. loss in translation. It's a nope. loss in translation? Yeah. Yeah, one and three sound alike in Chinese? This actually follows three previous launches, one in March 2010, one in November 2012, and one in September 2013. So it looks like they're bolstering their satellite military system, as it were, and uh, getting a worldwide tracking system in place. Now, there, there's not there's nothing wrong with that. Right? I mean, we have one. I'm, we probably have way more than one. I'm sure that <laughs> I'm sure many countries have this. So why they're... It's the fact that they're hiding it. Even even the U.S. military is like, hey, secret satellite, we're not going to tell you what it is, but here's live launch coverage. And, <laughs> like, there it goes. But uh, opposite of Copenhagen suborbitals. It makes me sad when we try to hide stuff like this because you can't hide it. It's impossible to contain information like this. <sighs> All right. Um, you know, I'm just going to really touch on this really quickly. Speaking of China trying to contain information, there's a possibility that in by the end of the year, China's going to be sending a, well, they'll likely be sending a mission to the moon. Mm -hmm. Now, what they're saying and kind of what we're looking at might be two different things. I guess we'll find out more information later, but the, the kind of one of the, one um, authors speculated that mm -hmm. China's actually sending a spacecraft to the moon mm -hmm. that will be an engineering prototype to determine the feasibility of them sending astronauts or uh, taikonauts, taikonauts? Yeah, taikonauts. taikonauts to the moon. And so that's pretty cool. Uh, it's towards the end of the year, they're good. they will in fact launch a spacecraft to the moon that will return to Earth, Earth for a soft landing. Um, it's officially going to be returning rock samples. Now, for it to be an engineering test, it would probably do a free return, much like Apollo 13 did. Sure. Um, or much like uh, Russia did back mm -hmm. when they were when we were all trying to race for the moon, they're saying no, 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 they're going to go into orbit. So we'll we'll see what happens at the end of the year. So outside of the idea that keeping information contained is stupid and sucks, and no one likes it, we want to see your cool rockets. We want to see the cool stuff you're doing in space. Don't try and hide it. It doesn't work. Um, outside of that, how awesome is it going to be if they are actually able to put humans back on the moon? That will be. 
pretty cool. cool. Really quick before we go to break, check out spacehack.org. It is a directory of ways to participate in space exploration. It's just a really cool website. It's not really a news item. I just thought, hey, we've got a really active community here on tomorrow, and a lot of people want to do more than just watch a show week after week. Maybe you want to help find asteroids. Maybe you want to, um, you know, give computing power to SETI. I don't even know if that's in their list, but I feel like there was some sort of shared computing power thing. Sure. Th this has three things on there. There's pages and pages of different things that you can do to, uh, well, participate in space exploration. So that was pretty cool. Once again, that's over at spacehack.org. All right, we're going to take a quick break. And when we do, we've got a live interview with Tyler Reno, who is the founder and CEO of Open Space Orbital. I actually sounded a little Canadian when I said that. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Tomorrow. Before we begin with this uh, interview segment, I did want to give a huge thank you to the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode go. These are the people who have contributed at least $5 to this episode, and you can get more information on that over at patreon.com slash tm. R -O. We are a crowdfunded show, and every single dollar helps. And speaking of crowdfunding, we've got Tyler Reno from Open Space Orbital joining us today. They're trying to crowdfund a rocket. Tyler, welcome to tomorrow, and tell us, what are you guys doing? Hi, Ben. So what we're doing is trying to develop Canada's first orbital launch vehicles uh, here in Nova Scotia. Uh, so it's as much of an exciting ad adventure as it is a historic one. It, traditionally, Canada has not launched much of anything, correct? I mean, that, that's not a place where we've launched rockets from. No, it really isn't. Uh, Magellan Aerospace out in Winnipeg uh, actually has quite an impressive track record of launching uh, sounding rockets. I mean, I think there are over 8,000 now, uh, but nothing orbital. So, so what will you be bringing into orbit with your rocket? Uh, well, we're hoping to de deliver uh, particularly very, very small satellites, uh, nano satellites laying less than 10 kilograms, uh, nano satellite constellations, and even really, you know, quite small micro satellites. But our, our vehicle's anticipated payload capacity is going to be uh, around 50 kilograms, which is much lower than just about any of our competitors, uh, and at the same time, much lower than, you know, any rocket really has ever targeted. So you're you're targeting kind of this smaller this smaller market, right? So you're using Kickstarter to help fund the rocket, but this would be a great rocket for other kickstarted satellite campaigns to launch up into space with. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, you know, in this industry, a hundred thousand dollars is is pennies, really. It it really doesn't get anywhere anybody all too close to developing a fully functional orbital launch vehicle. But what it does do is give a, give us an excellent opportunity to. Uh, refine our preliminary designs, uh, advance our company uh, business-wise, and put together a pretty impressive prototype engine that we're excited to develop. And from the chat room, JDNZ82 is wondering how much it's going to cost per launch. So if I've got, I'm starting a Kickstarter campaign of my own, I'm going to bring up nano satellites. Let's say your campaign's successful, you've got your rocket, how much for me to launch on your rocket? Yeah, that's a really fantastic question. Um, what I will say is I'll, I'll put it in terms of what we hope to accomplish. Again, we are in the development stages. What our research has shown and what a lot of the history in, in space has shown is that what we really need, not only to pr uh, provide great service to the already existent market, but in order to support a future market, uh, a market in which uh, just about anybody could get involved and develop really creative satellites, a, a cost that would allow that to take place, almost like uh, phone apps being developed for smartphones, you know, this would be kind of like satellites, right, being developed at that pace, that would be around a million dollars. Now, that's a relatively uh, crazy claim, uh, given the, the costs of launch uh, that have been seen up until today. 
that being said, well, particularly because the floor price of launching is usually about a million dollars. Before you even do just about anything, usually you've spent a million dollars uh, in the launch process. So it's, it's a large feat, uh, but we think that if we, if we can aim uh, to develop a very small, um, highly operable launch vehicle for around a launch price of about a million dollars, then we'd be not only of great support to one, two, three U kilogram, or sorry, three U uh, nanosats, uh, but we'd also uh, allow the emergence of all kinds of, of small satellite developing companies. So what do you have in, in, your, in your past to help uh, demonstrate that you're going to be capable of doing this in the future? Have you developed sounding rockets before? You know, what, what do you kind of have in the, in the previous area? Definitely. Um, so we are a startup. Uh, that being said, we're, we're taking a little bit um, of an X core like approach to this situation. We again, as a startup, we don't have all too much uh, de developed as a company as of yet. Uh, we were actually uh, incorporated this year. Uh, that being said, collectively as a team, we have performed some pretty impressive work with rockets, particularly our, our rocket engineer Adam Trumpour, uh, a music concept designer. Uh, and a propulsion system designer. Uh, he actually owns his own uh, propulsion uh, rocket lab. Uh, it's, it's quite remarkable. Uh, I visited it. It's, it's extraordinary. He's developed some really impressive uh, liquid propellant engines, uh, test fired them in full, and, uh, and he's going to be bringing that to the table for us. And, and when I mentioned that we were taking a little bit of an X core like approach, we're, we're taking step, we're recently approaching the situation step by step. So like we saw with Canadian Aero, which is a, a former Canadian company that was trying to perform manned missions, uh, that was way too much to bite off uh, at one time. And we're learning from that. And what we're trying to do is, is take it again incrementally by developing a small engine as a prototype, proving our design concepts, uh, moving on towards a larger scale first stage engine, uh, testing that, making sure that's right. Uh, and then taking it one step at a time and, and hopefully having funding come in at, at each step. So this $100,000 initial Kickstarter campaign, where does that get you in that scale of, of different things? Yeah, uh, so it really advances us um, in just about every direction with regards to company development. So from an engineering standpoint, it allows us to test uh, or, or develop actually our first prototype engine, which is a, kind of a test of our, our key design concepts in, uh, in the case in which we're trying to simplify uh, the liquid propellant uh, engine. Um, and also it helps us perform a nation-specific market analysis. Again, where Canada's never launched something in the past. There's never really been a need for that in-depth of a specific market analysis. Uh, so we're going to be completing that, finding out exactly exactly what sort of orbits uh, our, our existing customers, but also future customers are going to be launching into. Uh, we're going to be doing refinements to our business plan. Uh, there are also some legal expenses and so on, but the real meat of it, though, is that prototype engine that we're really excited to, to finally develop and to test out. So let's talk a little bit about that prototype engine for a moment. The chat room is actually very curious about that. Uh, BZWing at Zero is asking, what sort of propulsion method uh, are you looking at using? So uh, liquid fuel using, uh, is it RP1 liquid oxygen? What are you kind of thinking of using there? Yeah, uh, at, the, at the moment, um, it is... It, it basically demonstrates uh, some common understandings that have, have come to the table in the last decade or so. Uh, for one, uh, it most likely is going to be uh, RP1 and, and liquid oxygen uh, based, um, and that complies with uh, the ablative cooling approach that we're taking. To, we're basically, the main design concepts are to, uh, number one, uh, develop a vehicle that's extraordinarily, almost unseemly cost-effective, uh, and at the same time, lower the weight, uh, lower the weight of the vehicle. So when it comes to the engine, we really have to take any approach available to us to lower the weight. So that's going to include uh, ablative cooling instead of regenerative cooling. Uh, we're going to be using uh, a pressure-fed uh, system uh, for the for the um, for the engine uh, instead of uh, a, tur a turbojet uh, or yeah. A, a pump-fed system, um, and, and so on, and using composites like st strong uh, structural uh, carbon composite base, uh, other than a, a heavier, um, you know, more historically popular uh, metal base. So that, that's actually a, a huge undertaking, right? Because uh, using, for example, our carbon composites uh, s structure, we talked about that with Dave Maston a little while ago, which is extremely difficult to use in rockets. So that's a fairly experimental technology. This will be your first, you, it sounds like you're going to own the whole thing, right? You're going to own the engine, the structures, I assume most of the avionics. I mean, this is in-house, uh, you know, tip to tail, your own vehicle? 
Well, yeah, that's. Um, I, I'll be honest. I think that that's more of a, a long-term goal. Um, in addition to the great economic uh, or business opportunity, I guess uh, that we have on our plate, we also are, are, are most definitely looking outside of the of the box at the larger nation uh, or a larger national impact that a project like this can bring to the table. That it has the opportunity to bring to the table, and that's you know, and. and yeah, basically a result of it being a collaborative effort. So we actually have lots of uh, conversations open with um, companies actually competing for the contracts to develop those components. Uh, and for the time being, um, looking at it as more of a collaborative team effort, you know, as a, a Canadian effort, um, we're very open to that. And again, the, the day may, very well may come in which is a completely in-house process, but from our discussions thus far and the competition we've seen from potential manufacturers to develop our nozzles, to develop our, our COPVs, um, we think that it very well might start off as, a, as an, an outsourcing as well as an in-house effort. One thing that's going to kind of come up time and time again in some of these new space companies is that they need to be able to launch often, right? So you're only as good as is your ability to launch. If, if you only get a million dollars per rocket, then you're only getting a million per year if you only launch once or two million per year if you launch twice. So um, uh, Smarty987 asks, what will your turnaround time be, your expected turnaround time be between launches? Yeah, um, <laughs> we're hoping uh, that we'll be able to do it literally at the, at the snap of your fingers. Uh, well, you know, metaphorically speaking, um, we'd like to be able to launch every week. Uh, again, that's a lofty goal, and it's actually quite a popular goal. I believe uh, Peter Beck has mentioned that he'd like the, his new Electron rocket to be able to do that. Um, and I, I think that it makes a lot of sense. It's very uh, obvious that his team has put in the, the same sort of uh, you know research into the projected market. I, I always say it. You can't go where the puck uh, is right now, uh, just like Wayne Gretzky says. You have to go where the puck is going, and to satisfy the needs uh, in the the wildly growing uh, small sat industry uh, with, that is growing extremely exponentially, you have to develop a launch vehicle that can be launched very, very frequently, and it cannot be a process of. Uh, undergoing months and months and months um, of tests and reanalysis and certification for every single vehicle. It has to be highly uh, replicable um, and extremely reliable. Almost like the Scout rocket, actually. It's funny. We, uh, we had initially uh, diddled around with going with a, a solid propellant base, almost identical to the Scout rockets, actually, all solid propellant base. Uh, unfortunately, the costs associated with storing and, and handling uh, solid propellants are extraordinarily large, uh, particularly in Canada. So that placed, placed a very large barrier on us to go that route. But um, yeah, reliable, uh, yeah, reusability, especially launching every week, would be a massive asset. And, and you mentioned your Canadian company, which was um, uh, <laughs> sealed when you used a hockey reference. <laughs> um, um, uh, but uh, BZ Wing Zero is asking, where do you actually plan on launching from specifically? Because Canada, you're fairly far up north, which means that uh, it's a slightly less strategic place for uh, low Earth orbit type of launches. You'd be looking more at polar orbits or something like that. So where will you be launching from and what kind of orbits are you expecting? Yeah, so we're, we're uh, anticipating launch in the same general area, actually, that NASA targeted for a spaceport as well as Canadian Aero when they were, um, I guess, around. Um, it's basically around the Alder Point area. It's about a 46-degree latitude, and uh, it, it is quite convenient, actually, uh, for, for polar orbit. We're hoping to be able to provide a, a maximum altitude of 800 kilo, kilometers uh, and be, really be able to target uh, customers of the polar and, and sun-synchronous uh, orbit satellites. Um, and, and again, as for air traffic, we've actually looked into just about every area in Canada, and, and almost every, almost any uh, area in Canada could be a candidate um, for a launch site from that perspective. Uh, but again, given that we're a peninsula, we're uh, geographically, again, it's, it's not overly technical, but geographically speaking, we are, we are quite similar actually to Cape Canaveral in the sense that we're almost entirely surrounded by ocean. Uh, and again, we're, we're reasonably southbound. Uh, we're reasonably southern uh, in comparison to many other locations in, in Canada. We're not too far off from the equator. Um, and even speaking in terms of weather, um, again, a lot of people oppose the, the question of, well, what about the, the winters? Uh, again, in Canada, the winters can be a lot more severe than places like Florida and, you know, uh, and so on. But, um, but we actually feel, we've looked at the, that area, and we think that it's, it's most certainly avoidable. 
No, I would argue that Florida is really nasty to launch from because it's the lightning capital of the world and having a large metal vehicle with rocket fuel on it is, is not exactly a conductive or, or is conductive to launches, depending upon how you want to look at the scenario. Um, uh, Sophia asks, it seems like public-private partnerships are the principle by which American private launch providers have established themselves. Is this something you're considering? So are you moving beyond just crowdfunding and looking at partnering with companies as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Uh, in fact, we've already extended uh, an open hand um, to, to many uh, companies here in Canada. Again, one thing that we do suffer from is um, a relatively severe lack of, of support governmentally. Uh, the Canadian Space Agency has quite openly said that they have just just about no interest actually in supporting uh, a launch capability here in Canada and that they intend to focus uh, more more principally on the payloads uh, on the satellites themselves I actually uh, beg to argue that there's there are much deeper much more complex uh, consequences to making that decision that sort of decision it's not just a decision of saying okay we'll we'll launch with another country that's fine we'll let them take all the risks we'll let them have all the control in the launch industry and we'll just build the payloads it's a lot more complex than that in the sense that in an in an age in an era uh, in which the space industry is rapidly rapidly growing almost as almost as if uh, almost as the space or as the tech boom did um, in that sort of industry where many you know more prominent countries like the United States uh, like China like Russia are making such innovative in such aggressive moves uh, towards being dominant in space I fear that if we weren't to enter the launch industry we'd actually fall behind irrecoverably to this you know, basically to the degree that it would be virtually impossible for us to catch up from a capability standpoint with other countries in space and, and again as it becomes more prominent to mankind um, I, I think that it's a national responsibility to keep, to keep up um, but again kind of referring back to what you mentioned about uh, company to company partnerships and, and so on uh, we're very supportive of that. Uh, in fact, we, we, you know, with the companies that are, are open to doing outsourcing work for us and have strong uh, histories in composite uh, manufacturing and so on, uh, it's looking like there are definitely some partnerships, even in province, even in, province uh, in the work. So we're excited about that. And actually, along those same lines, Chris uh, Howlett asks, from the investor's perspective, if you're going for a companies or invest in, uh, investment money, what is your company, company offering that others are not? Yeah, so um, I guess I'll have to look at it in, in what context. So it, if it's what are we offering in terms of service? Um, it's definitely going to be that much lower, uh, that much lower payload, much smaller vehicle um, service uh, that is, is virtually. I don't. I from I've, I'm aware of just what every you know, rocket company in development right now. And even just about all of them are targeting a payload over 100 kilograms. Even the new Electron uh, rocket from Rocket Lab um, is stated as having a payload capacity of 110 kilograms starting off. Uh, 50 kilograms is a lot less. Uh, that being said, with our, our simplified approach and, and our, our main goal, again, of, of remaining dedicated, that's another thing, remaining extraordinarily dedicated to the, the members of this small satellite industry. Most companies have the the long-term goal of starting off with small launches, proving themselves, and then getting into the bigger stuff. We're actually taking a much different approach. We believe that the future is in the small stuff, and it's actually going to get smaller and smaller. Um, you looking at the numbers, uh, you know, up through 2020, um, the dominance of the one, two, three, four kilogram nano satellite is uh, indisputable. It, it's absolutely extraordinary. So if somebody like Open Space can come along. Put in the hard work and grind, grind it out, and develop a launch vehicle uh, that is so cost-effective that these small satellite customers no longer need to be a secondary payload, which is the big thing. It's just replacing the secondary payload with the primary uh, due to cost. Um, that's going to be extraordinary. So, as the only one of the only more prominent companies out there trying to do that, particularly in Canada, and given the advantages we have of being the only company in the country doing that. Um, with the excellent uh, launch site benefits that we have. Um, I think it, it makes for a combined package that's quite investor friendly, especially if we can execute the action steps uh, using that $100,000 um, if we're successful on a Kickstarter. And it doesn't hurt that we have a really great team uh, with plenty of experience to back it as well. 
So let's finish up with that Kickstarter a little bit. Uh, tell us, you know, you've got your $100,000 goal. What are some of the rewards and where can people go to help contribute? Absolutely. Um, I think for the, the, uh, the average space enthusiast, uh, aerospace engineer, aspiring astronaut, just about anybody with a passion for space, um, the rewards are, are quite attractive and just the sort of thing that uh, people love to take advantage of. Uh, some of them are having your name actually written within the casing of our first, first launch vehicle, uh, which is quite extraordinary, particularly given the sense that it would be the first uh, launch vehicle ever launched from Canadian soil uh, into orbit. Uh, one of the, the larger ones is actually the opportunity to press the launch button. Uh, we're hoping to actually launch our first vehicle in 2018, um, which is quite lofty, especially from our, our position right now, but we think given the magnitude of our, our vehicle, we, we should be able to do it if we're, if we're successful. Um, again, though, pressing that button, that, that you'd be the only person in all of history to say that you personally launched the, the first uh, vehicle into orbit from Canadian soil, so that would be quite exciting. And then there are other ones as well, like having lunch with uh, the open space team and, and being, able, being able to discuss the future of, of space exploration and space technologies. Um, there are smaller ones like t-shirts. Um, the opportunity to come and visit our, our engineering and, and launch facilities, get a full tour and, and, um, and accommodations and so on. So uh, there's a little bit of something for uh, every size of pledge. And then I certainly encourage people to check it out. The name of the Kickstarter um, is Open Space space access for all uh, but if you were just to search open space on Kickstarter uh, you'd find it and we're also on just about every social media feed as well sounds great hey Tyler thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday to join us and talk about what you're doing best of luck to you I think this is amazing that we're at a time in humanity where we can kickstart and crowdfund a rocket that's really freaking that's cool it, it is it's absolutely nuts right go back 20 years no one would even be able to consider something like this so best of luck to you you know, I appreciate that. I was just going to say real quick. You know, it's also wonderful, though, because it allows the public to actually play a role in the development. And with that, inter with that engagement, uh, it gets people more interested in space as well. So there's, there's two benefits. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I think it's incredible. Uh, I really hope that you're successful uh, and we'll be watching you and, and best of luck to you. All right. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, comments from our last show. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome future patrons of Tomorrow. If you're not familiar with who Tomorrow is, we're a live weekly webcast about the cosmos and human exploration of the stars. We'll feature things like rocket launches, we'll have guest interviews, we'll have amazing conversations about the cosmos, and of course an interactive chat room so that you can not only talk with other like-minded cosmic explorers, but also us, the hosts of the show as well. And we're just generally excited about humans exploring space and we're here on patreon as a way to crowdfund the show itself because this isn't something that a normal network would pick up but it is something that a lot of us are really really excited about for those of you not familiar with patreon think of it like a recurring kickstarter a way for you to contribute to the show but on a per episode basis instead of just once now you can contribute whatever amount you feel fit for these episodes but once you start hitting that $1 mark, we're gonna start giving rewards back to you. At $1, you'll get your name in the credits. At $5, you'll get your name in the credits. Plus, you're gonna get a exclusive Google Hangout. At $10, you get even more stuff. Contribute what you feel is fair. Now, you know what I said, this is on a per episode basis, and we do have more than one episode per month. So if you wanna make sure that you don't spend too much money per month, you can set an upper level cap. For example, you can contribute $5 per episode, but no more than $25 per month. Or you can contribute $1 per episode, but no more than $10 per month, whatever fits your budget. And if you'd like to see where your crowdfunded contributions are going, check out our goals. We're always getting new equipment. We're trying to do cool new things with social media. We're trying to do some amazing things in this space. And each goal helps us get closer and closer to realizing one of those new things. With the help of you, our patrons, we can make this show truly something special. And let me be the first to welcome you to tomorrow. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get into comments from our last show, I did want to give a huge shout out to all the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific episode go. Now, these are the Patreon Plus subscribers. These are people who have contributed at least $3 to this specific episode. And then we've also got our Patreon subscribers. 
These are people who've contributed one dollar to this specific episode. Now, every single dollar helps. We, like I said earlier, we are a crowdfunded show, and so uh, you can go in and you can contribute just one dollar to each episode. That'd be approximately four dollars per month, and it makes a huge difference to us being able to do different things, do really cool things. And in fact, after this show, we're going to be going back and ordering the um, the new HP server for our graphic generation and. Um, uh, the crowd stuff that's going to go on the bottom of the screen is going to be awesome. You can get more information at patreon.com slash TMRO. I have been on Reddit too long because every single time I've said that in the show this far, yes. I've wanted to say patreon.com slash R slash TMRO. Nice. And that is not correct. Nice. <laughs> All right. Um, let's get into uh, uh, some of the... Actually, this was this image is something that I had mentioned last week. Oh, yeah. It's something that uh, we were going to skip and I could bring up uh, forward. Check this out. Uh, this is a, a picture that is from, oh man, I don't even have the information. Uh, we found this on Reddit, speaking of, and you can actually get uh, information at the bottom. has nothing to do with tomorrow, TMRO, but we thought it, I thought it was just gorgeous. And uh, you, can, you can buy that at the bottom of the screen. Uh, it's just, it's kind of one of those inspiring pictures that I think is really cool. I wish I had remembered to bring the moon water picture over to the desk. Oh. You know, we'll show that in After Dark. So if oh, you're yeah. curious, we've got another picture that we've purchased uh, that looks absolutely amazing, and we've got it here in person. It's a hard copy. Uh, so there you go. You've got information at the bottom of your screen if you think that's cool. There are other pictures there as well that kind of have that same general look and feel that I think are absolutely awesome. All right, let's get started with some actual comments. This one comes from Daniel from Patreon. I haven't heard a ton about the concept of building a bigger, better, nicer space station yet. Something that would support science, but be supported by tourism and even extended stay living quarters. What I'd like to see is a space station that has true artificial gravity, giving the ultimate views while allowing for normal gravity-filled living too. All right, so yeah, uh, we, I, I guess we kind of do talk about that. That's Bigelow stations, right? Yeah, that will be a, a privatized bit. space station up in space. The problem is, let's just say that we had the most biggest, baddest, assest, awesomest space station up there right now for tourism. How are you getting there? Right? I mean, we don't... The, <laughs> yeah, no, no, for sure. Exactly. It doesn't matter what's so up there. So let's just say, yo, yeah, yeah, let's say you get a free stay on the space station. Right. You just need to arrange your transport there. Sure. It's a $70 million, maybe, if Russia will let you do it. If, yeah, if, if they let you. If they let you. Right. I think it's cheaper for, you know, non-NASA people. But, right. but still, still. It's, the problem right now isn't necessarily space station. I think that will be solved with um, Bigelow, or at least... Um, helped a lot by Bigelow. Right. Uh, the problem right now is the transport system. Now, we're getting into a place, it's amazing, we've got all these companies. So, two weeks ago we did the Electron Rocket. Right. Today we did Open Space Orbital. Mm -hmm. Next week, for those who don't know, next week we're bringing Firefly Space on. So they're gonna you be talking about- You asked for it, you got it. You asked for it, you got it. So all of these small launcher companies, some of them will remain in the small launcher business because sure. there is a huge market coming up there. Tyler wasn't wrong. There's a huge market coming up there. But some of them may grow larger as well and start carrying humans, much right. like SpaceX kind of started with the Falcon 1 at small launcher mm -hmm. and moved to the Falcon 9, the Falcon 9 1.1, the Falcon Heavy. You know, uh, they have Dragon. Then now Dragon V2 is coming right, out. Right. And then eventually the Mars Colonial Transport. So, you know, you could see a clear path there. Maybe sure. other companies will do that same clear path and allow us to get to these space stations. Mm -hmm. But today... Doesn't matter. You can't do it. And artificial gravity, uh, you mean spinning the space station, right? Because we don't. I didn't. We have not mastered I gravity. Mean, there is no. Uh, right. You, we, we don't. We no, don't know no, how to create artificial no, we gravity. Did. I saw than, in the eighties on Star Trek. On Star Trek, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we need to spin it. <laughs> yeah. Um, for also from Patreon, David says. I was wondering, when talking about colonization, if you guys have ever discussed the ethics of pregnancy in a sub. Uh, sub G environment. Consider how adaptable humans are. Assuming a woman can even carry a fetus to full term in anything under 1G, a human child born and raised on Mars would look very different and may have some serious health issues. Yeah, that's an interesting point because we haven't, there is no human that's been born in space before. Right. Um, we haven't had this as a topic yet. I don't know. I don't know if it's an ethics issue per se, right? Well, because. Yeah, I, I do. I see <clears throat> exactly your point. Um, and I think this could be a main topic uh, coming up here shortly because <laughs> we could talk about this right now if you want 
for at least 13 minutes. <laughs> All right. So we'll hold off, but it's something to consider. <laughs> Actually, leave your comments in the chat room. What do you think about um, humans having children in space when we've never done this before? We don't know what's going to happen. I, we the, don't even know if you can conceive in space at this point. Right. I think the initial ethics issue comes up in the, if you think that the probability of a child having some major serious health issues, do you continue to try and have the child But don't you need to evolve? Already? Don't you... Right. Yes, that is an interesting. Okay. That is an interesting conversation. That you, kudos, by the way. <laughs> that's a really interesting conversation. So there you go. I think we're going to hold that one in our back pocket for a future show when okay. a guest maybe accidentally doesn't show up or something like that. Uh, Dada, did, the it's next one's from you. Did you want to voice it for us? Ooh. There you go. It, I'm making him press like nine click, million click buttons. Button. All right. All right. Button. So there you go. All right. Can you read it? Uh, yeah. Okay, ready to go. What did you say? If Apollo 13 happened on the way to Mars, the death toll of the Apollo program would be six, not three. That's most certainly correct, right? Now, my only rebuttal to that is, so what? Now, I know that sounds terrible and cold-hearted, but... Um, yeah, no. Well, no. I mean, uh, we will lose humans in space. Yes. Uh, in the future, people will die in space. Yes. People will die on Earth. People will die in cars. They're going to die in planes. And I know it's a very cold-hearted way to look at it, but we shouldn't prevent space travel because someone will die. That's right. not what you were saying, but that was the point that I wanted to make, which was <laughs> you just simply said... I, I heard what you said, and the answer is no. Kind of. All you said was the death toll would be six, not three. You didn't. You, there was no anything other, other than pure data, which is almost certainly correct. I then expanded on that to say, yeah. You know, why don't you just make your own comments? I should. <laughs> Ben's comments from Ben's show last week. Hey, just checking. <laughs> this one comes from Mini e oh, Did you? I mean, right? Yeah. Okay. Mini Elon from uh, slash. Uh, this is from Reddit slash r slash tmro. Oh, it feels so much better to say slash r now. Good. Go ahead. Go ahead. Wow. Uh, there's a great low cost options. Uh, for small businesses wanting to launch a small satellite in space. I see a possible market for this rocket in an overseas market more than the American market because opportunity for launching small satellites is very slim in these developing countries. And at a low-cost launch rate, we will see more Kickstarter campaigns start to pop up in the not-too-distant future. Ha <laughs> Ironic, because that was exactly the main topic of the show this Dang. week. A Kickstarter campaign. Uh, th th I think what excites me most about uh, Tyler and Open Space Orbital is that it is a Kickstarter campaign mm -hmm. about building a rocket Boom! Even two years ago, on this very show, I said that was impossible. Yes. I, I, I am eating my words right now. Now, even if the campaign... Happily, though. Happily, happily. happily, happily mind you. Eating my... Oh, no, I was, I was straight up wrong. I, I know. Yeah, no. Um, even if the Kickstarter campaign isn't successful, and I hope it is, but even if it's not, uh, it shows that we're getting closer to the point where this yes. can happen. And I think that's very exciting. That's I, th huge. I think that's really cool. And you need to take more of a Copenhagen approach to it than, mm -hmm. say, maybe a SpaceX when you're doing a Kickstarter campaign. Sure. But uh, if that makes any sense. Um, but yeah, I, I think that we're going to see a, more of these crop up and hopefully some cool, interesting ideas as to how to get small sats into space, the nano sats. Because mm -hmm. going as a secondary payload kind of sucks. And yeah, as. Um, as was mentioned on the Electron rocket interview, mm -hmm. um, sure, your cost per kilogram may be lower, mm -hmm. but your still overall cost is way higher. Right. So, yeah, you can move more stuff up there, but if you only have a thing that's this big, you don't care about your cost per kilogram. Right. You care about your total cost to get the th this right. thing into space. Yes. Unless you're going to the secondary panel or something. Yeah. I can't pronounce this at all, so this comes from YouTube. Okay. Cinderite? Cinderite? Siderite? Siderite? Zachwidex. <laughs> Zachwidex. Yeah. Okay, all right. Bring it up. Oh, I will show. Sorry. All right. How do you think we should be pronouncing that? Sid. Uh, right? Maybe it's side right. Zachwidex. Maybe it's side right. Zachwidex. Side right. Zachwidex. Right. You see that, right? Sure. Sure. Side or right. Anyway, this commenter says. That solid booster test looks like the perfect way an evil mastermind would try to kill James Bond. <laughs> no, Mr. Bond. I expect you to fry. I, you said that wrong. It's, no, Mr. Bond, I expect you to fry. Yeah, it's more how you evil villain that. Well, then you should have read that. Yeah, well, maybe I should have. I uh, this note, was... A note for all of our international viewers. I did not put an accent on that. 
Oh, uh, I thought specific. that was hilarious. Uh, that, that was is, for the that ATK is. five segment solid rocket booster. And yeah, actually, fun little factoid: uh, there was some sand underneath all of that. Mm -hmm. That after the solid segment went for, I think, it was two minute test firing, mm -hmm. turned to glass. Yeah. I think we should make jewelry out of those things. I, You know, it'd probably be kind of ugly, but it'd be really cool. Don't care. Yeah. Kind of don't care. Yeah. All right. Uh, this one comes from FPV Reviews. From YouTube. From YouTube, yes. Um, what are the chances of going back to the moon and reutilizing some of the equipment left behind by the Apollo missions? Ideas, anyone? Uh, not fan. So... I, I feel like those are historical monuments. Okay, take that aside. They've been up there for how long? Like 50 years. Okay, so their structural integrity well, I could don't be know. crap. Could be, though. I mean, I mean, you you take out the historical significance. Yeah, but what's left? We've got some lunar rovers. Or lunar rover. Yeah, one that has a, a broken wheel. We'll bring up a, we'll bring up a spare tire. You, but you see what I'm saying. <laughs> My point still remains, right? Yeah. I mean, there's only so much... That you could really use out of with fifty old, year old material anyhow, so uh, taking away the historical significance, which I, I do still uphold and believe in, and, mm -hmm. and absolutely. Sure, sure. But even if you could, even if you had to for some reason, you were the you 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 shot to the moon on 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 some sort of adventure or something, and you mean in the meantime turned around and saw the Earth blow up. That's it. It's you now. Well, it's then there's no historical you. significance. I mean, there's no sure, one to remember that. That's what I'm saying, though. Then what do you do with that? Can you actually use it? Well, you took How? this and went way over there with that. I'm just though. saying, because I knew you would go with, like, well, history and blah, 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 and everyone should respect. How blah. dare we respect history? I'm just saying, though, on top, above and beyond all of those, that situation. I don't know how usable that stuff would actually still be. Yeah, I don't either. Um, and most of it's, you know, you've got the descent oh, stage, which is not an ascent stage. So I don't know what you're doing with that. Um, you got a couple flags that have been blown over or taken down. Um, some footprints. Right. And, I, oh, I mean, some satellite. They've, they've got the, like, the, the, the laser tests and whatnot on the moon. Oh, so you've got mirrors? Yeah, you got the you little mirror thingies, the try reflectors. Try to hope to something aliens. <laughs> boop, 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 Anybody got to ride to Mars? Boop, boop, boop. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I just... In in a realistic sort of manner, <laughs> Chris Chris Hollett says, "What would be the point? That's like using the Titanic to build a ship." Kind of. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. I, I just don't see. And 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 and. Ooh, because Sophia, it the is radio so isotope generator may still work. That was, so that would be electricity. Sure. That would be cool. All that right. would be all right. Well, that's not the opposite of cool. Would be warm. But you know, whatever. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I feel even... All right. So yes. let's just say it did work. I don't sure. think we should touch it. No, I, think, I don't think we should either. I think it should really be considered historical monuments. Yes. Uh, and we should actually be careful to not disturb those areas, at least not in the beginning. Right. We, as we populate the moon with hum humans and we build colonies up there, maybe we can kind of build around them or build, you know, preservation domes or something. I don't know, around them so that sure. you can actually go in and enjoy them and everyone can experience them. Right. But how... Awesome of a future will that be when you get to go to the moon yourself on like a one week journey mm -hmm. expedition of sorts. Mm -hmm. You just hang out, you just hanging out on the moon. You're you need to make that commercial. You know, let's let's hit the uh, the Armstrong Museum, right? And uh, let's let's go see where uh, where all the pictures are taken. I or you know, right? I think that will be freaking cool. All right. <laughs> Final comment from YouTube. This is from Bill. Thank you, Bill. Communications is a product which feels a, com a commercial industry which fires routine access to GSO. I a geostationary that's... orbit. Thank you. Somewhere out there is a moon product and or Mars product and or asteroid product which requires frequent boots on the ground access to those orbits to be profitable. Right now we are just holding our breath, exploring, developing, and providing the technologies, lowering the cost, getting ready for the discovery that will trigger the next big gold rush. Then that is where human humanity will go next. I mean, there's Lewis and Clark go, and then there's Gold Rush go. Yeah, you know, there will be a Gold Rush in space. We just haven't yes. found it yet. And yes. I don't disagree with Bill at all. We need to find that that critical thing in space. And it's there. It's definitely there. But people don't really, people won't care until it impacts them directly. Right. And when they when they realize there's a gold rush up there, then everyone's going to want to be there because then it could impact them in a positive mm -hmm. way directly. But until then, it's so hard and so expensive, and it, they just don't. Most people don't see how 
it actually does impact them on a daily life that mm -hmm. they just don't care. So I'm excited for when that happens. And I think a lot of these smaller companies, um, they're going to they're going to do some pretty cool things to help us realize what's what's going on up there. Even outside of the launchers, we've got Deep Space Industries. We've got um, the other one, Planetary Resources. <laughs> I'm like, there's a, there's the other one. They're cooler. Uh, planetary resources. Well, they are. Uh, you know, asteroid mining type stuff. There's yes. a lot of really great stuff going on uh, in space, and you don't just need it to be a rocket. You you can do some pretty cool right. things to to do a lot of that stuff. All right, that's our show for this week. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. Join us next week when we bring on Firefly Space Systems to talk about their new carbon fiber slash aerospike engine it's rocket crazy. it's cr it's, awesome. it's awesome i'm super excited for what they're doing stay tuned after dark's up next if you're a patreon at the patreon plus subscriber level you can watch that right away otherwise anyone else it'll be available in four weeks thank you so much we'll see you next week Coming up, the Heat 2X engine from Copenhagen. Some awesome re-entry footage from SpaceX. And we're joined live by Tyler Reno, the CEO and founder of Open Space Orbital. And talk about random <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> Start the show! <laughs> random <laughs> and stuff. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Five.